from yours. Okay, that's fixed it. No more distortion. So it was the other earphone, was it? Okay, are you hearing me okay now, Dr. Marie? Brilliant, brilliant. Oh, fantastic. Okay, oh my gosh, the difference that earphone uh, makes. Yeah, Afrojamo saying that's better. Didi saying much better. Sister B saying great sister Shanice. And guess audio is cracking and distorted. Oh dear, uh, much better after adjusting headphone. Oh, fantastic. Uh, it's clear now. Thank you, Itana. Uh, thank you, Tag 104. Thank you, Kwame. Thank, thank you. Okay, everyone's saying that it's good now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely fantastic. Oh, family, thank you, thank you for that. I was really getting worried. As you can see, I'm always hot here. I was just getting even hotter and more sweaty then. I was thinking, oh my gosh, get my fan out. <laughs> yeah, so um, let's get on, let's press on uh, with the show today. Uh, very importantly, I want to, um, I just heard myself feeding back there. I want to give you the link to Dr. Marie's uh, website. And I'm going to post that uh, in the chat so that you've got um, so that you've got it. Uh, I just heard a little crackle. I hope it's not starting again. But uh, here is the link for that will take you to Dr. Marie's website. There you can find out all about Dr. Marie. You can find out about the books uh, that she's got available because she's been doing some amazing, amazing work. Okay. Um, I'm going to move out the way fairly quickly because I think the distortion may be happening uh, my end family. So uh, what I would like to do is to um, introduce our esteemed guest uh, very early on and hope that, you know, all is well her end and that you get the presentation so we can go into discussion. Okay, family. So um, our, our beautiful queen is a researcher. She works in education. Uh, she lectures in education and she's been doing some quite considerable uh, research for some time and behind her in the background there, you can see some of the magazines that she's been doing. And uh, I've even got one of her books, family, and I can tell you, it is amazing. The information that she has been gathering to prove beyond doubt using, you know, artifacts to show the connections between uh, our African culture on the continent of Africa and on the British Isles, making the direct link to show that our ancestors brought their culture with them and were actually present thousands of years ago on the, in the British Isles. So I can hear myself squeaking. So Dr. Charles, I'm gonna get out of the way because of the technical challenges and hand over to you. Firstly, uh, as you bring your presentation up, please do introduce yourself to the audience. It's something I would normally have done, but you see the challenges we're having. So please introduce yourself to the audience as you prepare to deliver your presentation today. And the topic title is Our True African History as Original. Oh, oh, we are in the presentation. Over to you, Dr. Charles. Can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? Yes, we're seeing your screen. Okay. So as uh, Sister Shanice has outlined, we ca I kind of feel a little bit anxious, particularly with the technical issues that, that, that we actually do start. Um, and I'd like to start the presentation, if that's okay. Yes, please do. Go so ahead. the title is Foundational Black Britons, and we are connecting our global material culture. That's what I major in. This is about evidence gathering. And as you can see on the left-hand side, the faces, these are the faces that they don't want you to see. These are the black founders of Britain, the FBBs, the foundational black Britons who are sovereign to the land. Now, what I am gonna to do tonight is to 
discuss some of the language because some of our listeners, because we're all differentiated, it's like being in the classroom as a primary school teacher and a teacher of uh, further education. I know that there are vast differences in any classroom. So some of us will embrace this information. Others will reject it. I'm quite prepared for that tonight. And others will need more information. So these are the faces of our ancestors who are the foundation of Black Britons. They are the primordial Paleolithic people who settled these lands and created our culture and traditions. People can only change their minds if they are permitted to see the evidence. So when we're talking about foundation of Black Britons, it's very important that we understand our African antecedents, which equal our ancestry. And so we can see on the right hand side, our African antecedents. And on the left hand side, are the foundational Black Britons. And as you can see through the comparative uh, archaeology and the evidence, uh, the cultural continuities, the faces, the carvings, the symbolism, I'm gonna go into very heavy symbolism tonight. So we have been given a prima facie history it's time to reclaim and restore our culture and stop giving it over to other cultures. Culture is to the human what water is to the fish. It is our total environment. And like the fish out of water, many students can be out of their culture and thereby act inappropriately or fail to thrive. We, are the recipients of false historical narratives which create a distorted reality daily. We need to put those faces of the foundational Black Britons into our psychological faculty, place them into our heads so that they become the norm instead of the exception. But let's delve into some language. And don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Some people will say we shouldn't be using black. But in Greek, more means black. But the word did not originate in Greek. There are other languages much older than Greek. So in the Berber languages, more means land. And these are older than the Greek languages. So the word black is from the Indo-European root. Indo is Sanskrit, which is over 10,000 years old. And in Proto-Sanskrit, black is bleg, which means to shine or burn. Phlegian in Greek and flagrai in Latin. So the b, ph in Proto-Sanskrit transliterates to the p, ph, Greek. And this transliterates to f in Latin. Black air in Dutch and Blech in modern English. Every word that we speak has an ancient origin, but these root words were then transliterated by later Europeans who classify themselves as white. And as Grand Sheikh Taj Tariq Bey reminds us, black is termed civilita mortuus, dead in the eyes of the law a word put in place to escheat the people's estates and steal their allodial titles as Aboriginal people. So in understanding language and searching out our definitions, we know when we should be using particular words, when we are describing our lineage. So we understand that in terms of law and politics, the definition of black. But let's, again, let's understand language and don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. As you can see here on the left, we have the Mauryan stone, derivative of the Moors, which was found in Ireland. Now, the province that that was found in 
which I talk about in issue six, is now called Munster, but it was called Mumu, its original African name or indigenous name, which meant Lord of the Land. Now the word Maru, the name by which the population west and northwest of Babylonia was known to the Babylonians, an important Sumerian text published by Professor Langdon states that the pre-Sumerians population of Babylonia itself was Mauryan. In one of the Hittite historical texts, Muri, Mat, Oru, Mori and Amura as geographical spaces and places are explicitly identified. And so from the historical text, quote, when my grandfather, Sub Bilu, was marched into the country of Muri, he smote the whole of the Muri men and established his frontier on the farther side of Amura. The city of Muru or Muri was on the coast of southeastern Sicia, known as Anatolia. End quote. Murian also serves as a variant of Morian or Moor, as in Anthony Munden's play, John Kent, quote, a monstrous Morian, black a moor. Or John Lyley's Euphius, quote, a fair pearl in a Morian's ear cannot make him white. Interestingly, Morian, Moorish, or pertaining to the Moors appeared as Morian, Moor, Mora, as well as the plural Morris and Moren, could itself simultaneously mean root, branch or stock. And this was already linked with an early sense of race itself as root or stock. And so we don't reject the word Moor or Morian, we hold on to it and we use it in specific contexts. We also know the Babylonians at different times among Sumer or Chaldean, and they describe themselves as jet black. It's interesting that that Morian stone um, is made of agate and it was known to have healing properties. So, in understanding our ancient traditions, Kemeta Ube, master teacher of law and linguistics, tells us that the original and ancient term white supremacy goes back to the Nile Valley civilization. The southern part, the white crown, as the crown of the south, won the war which showed sovereignty over the land. White means pure and pure means God ruler of the land. This phase came out of our culture, but the later Europeans who classify themselves as white adopted it and used the title to purify himself from his albinism. They have us calling them white when they are not, just like Caucasian, which shows that it is not associated with their skin. Moors were living in the Caucasus Mountains by the Capsian Sea, and those Moors were called Caucasians. But our people think that we are talking about skin complexion when it has something to do with the region. The Caucasus meaning high mountains. When we study ancient history and origin, it has nothing to do with the later European, Caucasian and white. They are taking it from an ancient culture, meaning to have lordship. The use and origin of white in Africa was about sovereignty and rulership. Now in issue seven, I talk about how white fun fun or even is a revered color for the Yoruba because it is the color of the mild mannered benevolent Orisha straddling the landscape of the Yoruba cosmos. The eye and Orun are shown as a white orb or egg. Incidentally, the queen, the current queen of England, in her coronation in 1956, is holding an African symbol of the eye and the Orun, which shows the lower and upper realms as above, so below. 
But again, our children won't be taught that in the schooling system. She's holding an African symbol. Now, we must be codified as a group. Foundational Black Americans, as coined by Tariq Nasheed in 2020. FBA is not a group. FBA is not an organization. FBA is a lineage. A lineage is lineal descent from an ancestor, ancestry or pedigree. As a result, we are the descendants of the African and Aboriginal Blacks who built the United States. Now, of course, we can see a kinship over in here in Britain as the foundational Black Britons because it's important to understand the correct appellations which tie the true indigenous people to the land and their estates. We know that more and moorish means land. The Carthaginians, the Phoenicians, the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Fair Bulog, the Tuatha de Danan, the Milsians, the Godials, the Fomerians, the Nemedians, who are the Numidians, the Partholonians, the Etruscans and the Pelasgians. These are all black people. We must come together as one to recognize that we seeded the planet as first frequency people who built Britain. And if you see issue seven, Dr. Winters very kindly wrote the introduction to the Phoenicians in Britain and Nigeria to show all of those migrations. Now, why do we use the word Britain? Because it's ours. We must be codified as a group. Here are the Phoenicians over to the left. Britain is a name given to the island by the Phoenicians calling it Baratanas. The name Phoenicians given to them by Greeks means dark skinned. Let's look at the derivatives and the etymology of bara tanas. Ba signifies the world soul, which exists within man and the universe. Ra is a nature of light and victory of protection and of immeasurable power. He is the seen force of the universe manifested by the sun, the symbol used to describe energy. Ra is the energy that allows light to shine. Anas is of Hebrew derivation pronounced Anas, which means a giant or hero. The Irish word Anas or Anak means save, defend. Anakal means protection, also the safeguard of a prince. You see how it's connected to the lordship and the sovereignty of the land? Additionally, Anas contains the word Anna, a name like all other versions of the milk giving mother. She represented wealth or plenty and came to be synonymous with abundance. The Tuatha de Danan of ancient Ireland, who I write about in issue six, were black and were also known as the tribes of Anna. The Anu, Twa, Koi, Danans are the original people of the planet. The Irish scholar Thomas Keane states the only historical references made to the colour of the Tuatha de Danan describe them as black. Quote, the rusty large black youth, Goban Ser, and his black race. We find in the Dogon language the word Ba Ra'ank Maza, a water figure. That's interesting, which connects the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians were master seafarers. Therefore, the ancient melanated cultures were tied etymologically to the origin and naming of Britain as Baratanas. We are the original Baratanans, which would later become Britons. Now, we see Goban Ser, the Irish, which means the Irish blacksmith, but we can also trace the African root to that word called Gubasa and Gobunu, which means the blacksmith and the ceremonial 
iron sword. So linguistically and through words, we can trace the black origin of a lot of these terms that take us back to the root. We must be codified as a group. What does Dr. Winters teach us? That there were no whites in Kemet in the beginning, but the ancient Egyptians identified themselves as black. We must not throw away these terms. Oh, we can't use black. Yes, we can, because it's deep in our history. They called themselves black because blackness related to their affinity with the creator. In 1981, UNESCO published the second volume of the General History of Africa, part two. And Sheikh Anta Diop made a major contribution to this volume. And this chapter was titled Origin of the Ancient Egyptians. In this chapter, Diop made it clear that the Egyptians identified themselves as Kemeteru, Kemet in writing. Using linguistic methods falsifies any claim that Diop failed to explain that Kemet meant black. Dr. Obadeli Gambon shows us through the Madhu Necha divine speech, Kem Jed Ten Ma'at, to be black, speak you Ma'at. How beautiful is that? Black means more than just an adjective in African languages. This is very important, Dr. Winters says. Historically, he has traced that the dynastic history of China, they called themselves Li Min, the black people. In the Assyrian culture, they called themselves Salmat Ka Kadi, the black people. Sagiga in Sumeria an Akkad culture, Mashika, the Aztec culture in Mexico, Lord of the Black Land. Ma means great, she means black, and Ka means land. And the black Olmecs of Mexico were called she. This is all about the, the, to revere blackness. We must not throw this away. We must understand our history, our ancestral understanding of black. In the, is the strongest term in the Nasubiti pharaonic language, Tong, which is the etymological origin of the well known root Kemet. Dr. Richard King teaches us our ancestral understanding of black. Africans called it Kem and the Greeks called it melanin. The ancient Kemites represented Kem, blackness as a piece of wood, burnt at the end, as you see. This does not simply mean burned from a tree as a piece all burnt up. No, it means infused of wood from the tree with spirit. This is life. This is blackness, life with deep symbolism and it being so intense that it turns black. Now, I do have a section in the latest issue which talks about the reverence of trees and the spirits and why our ancestors use trees. Black was the colour of the night sky, primeval ocean, outer space birthplace and womb of planets, stars and galaxies. Black was the colour of carbon, the key atom found in all living matter. Carbon atoms linked together to form black melanin, the first chemical that could capture light and reproduce itself, the chemical key to life. And the brain itself was found to be centred around black neuromelanin. the science of blackness. As you can see in the middle, that usually would rotate that picture of the skull, but the medulla oblongata in the brain and the spinal column contains melanin. Melanin is the vital chemical that makes life itself. Melanin is an intelligence. That's why they have to lock it down through the education system. 
melanin is not just an isotope or a polymer. It is an intelligence. If you look to the left, you can see microscopic section of the medulla oblongata stained with a blue dye. Normal melanin is visible as dark patches, and this has been magnified 10 times. Now, this is very, very interesting. Distribution of normal leptomenageal melanin was supported by findings from Gaboski and Blavia's 96 study. And what they found was that in 28 of the 31 black subjects, it showed a hypo intensity of melanin, but less or no hyper intensity of melanin in the 43 non-black subjects. You see how blackness biochemically operates differently in melanated people. This is very important. And I want you to keep hold of that image of the skull with the medulla oblongata. It's key. The locus Corelius, literally meaning the black dot, is the uppermost point in an all-black neuromelanin nerve tract that runs from the brain stem into the spinal cord. And this has been mapped and found in the 12 brain sites containing the melanin. Now, if you look over to the picture to the left, you see that the dark pigmented neurons in the substantia nigra or nigra are reduced in the Parkinsonian brain. You see how vital the blackness and the science of blackness is? Blackberry is the black name of a fertilized egg known as a moor ruler. Moor, you see? A solid ball of cells resulting from a division of a fertilized ovum and from which a blastula is formed. If you are a human being, you start from a blackberry a marula showing the ancestry of life. Two hormones are created when the marula attaches itself to the woman's uterus called ACG melanocyte stimulating hormone, which is the essence that controls black pigment cells. So from day one, blackness is building the scaffolding of the human body. It is directing and telling DNA what to do. Melanin dictates to DNA and melanin precedes DNA. What does Dr. Carl Marit tell us? That this photo is of a 35 day old embryo and the eye is pure melanin. All the dark black streaks in the image are melanin. When the embryo is first formed, it has a dark streak all along its outline, and it's all melanin, end quote. And yet they don't want you to use the word blackness. No, we have to hold on to this. We see over here to the left, extracted melanin that is, has a recording of 737 voltage in sunlight. What do recent studies show us? They show us that melanin has the capacity to split water into diatomic hydrogen and oxygen with sunlight as a catalyst. This was only believed to be what plants could do, photosynthesis, but it occurs in humans as it does in plants. Hold on to that sunshine. It's very, very important. We are literally walking batteries. Batteries, they are now recreating based on natural melanin pigments. Scientists at the City University of New York have found a way to recreate melanin's properties in synthetic polymer. People with darker skin have lower rates of cancer. So the polymer will be used to protect the skin against sun exposure and skin damage. 
So why are they telling you to stay out of the sun? Let's look very carefully at what's happening here. This ultraviolet UV light camera shows us how the sun sees you. And later Europeans or second frequency are covering their skin with the chemical created covering of melanin in the form of a sunscreen to protect them from the sun. And so they are essentially turning themselves black to become you, to protect them from the sun in which they're telling you to stay out of. But our ancestral understanding and inner standings of blackness is about a high science. Remember the medulla oblongata in the skull that I showed a couple of slides back? It's very important. Here we see Heru placed on the Nasubiti Kafre, placed directly behind the medulla oblongata. Heru as the falcon bird. He's placed on this in this particular position because of the high concentration of melanin, which signifies the projection of the supermind, which is blackness that is hidden. And we see the shape of the medulla obligata in the picture below. Our ancestors in their genius understood this and they embraced their blackness, but this is hidden from us. Now the picture to the right is from Ireland and it is a crozier, which is what the priest would hold in church. And this image I've enlarged, I've blown up. And at the back of the priest's head, you see an animal bird positioned in the same placement as Caffrey, on the back of the head, positioned on the supermind, blackness. So he's clearly carrying on the tradition in Ireland thousands of years later and continuing the tradition. This is hidden esoteric knowledge that we should know about. That's a very, very powerful image. But they're not going to show you this in the schooling system or the university. They fully understood their blackness. This is the back view of Tutankhamun's sar sarcophagus, and it has been stylized in the shape of the medulla oblongata, as within, so without. His head signifies a stylized representation of the medulla oblongata, a very powerful symbol of blackness. If we look to the picture to the right, it's, they're actually called medulla pyramids, which contain the melanin, the blackness, and the ponds at the top, are they generate the rhythm of breathing and breath, which we know in meditation and our ancient ancestors understood the power of breath, projection and elevation. Our ancestors have left their material culture for us to remember, remember. Our framework of potential possibilities and greatness as first frequency people. The white mask is a metaphor for this insight and return to first sight consciousness. And we see here on the uh, right hand side, the artifact from Ireland, which is shaped in an egg, which is also very important. But you see those traditions being carried on and forward into the British Isles. Let's not, I, it's very important that we understand, that's why I went through this foundation of language, what white actually means, what black actually means from its historical reference points, and also that we reclaim the word Britain as Bharatanas 
from the Phoenicians. And that we understand the word Moor and Moorish and Morian and Mori men. They're also from Scotland and I'm doing some research on that. So that we know specifically when to use those words and in what context. So what did those early 19th century researchers know and tell us? Whether in the Aran Islands off the coast of Ireland, the Hebrides, and the Scottish Highlands, Wales, Cornwall, or the counties about London, we know that the earliest type of man in Britain was as long-headed as the African Negro. The discoveries of abundant prehistoric remains all over Europe, particularly France, they tended to show the European Aborigines of the Stone Age were not mongoloid like the Laps, but the exact opposite. In every detail, they resembled the dolichocephalic Negroes of Africa. Dr. Boyd Dawkins below tells us that the Iberians of France and Spain, the Salures of Wales, the Ligures of Southern Gaul and Northern Italy, and the small dark Etruscans are to be looked upon as ethnological islands isolated by successive invasions pointing out that if we go deep enough into the past, which the schooling system will never allow, we should find that the whole of Europe was inhabited by a swarthy, non-Aryan population. And we know the etymon of swarthy is svart, svart, which means black. Foundational Black Britons. Ancient hunters in Ireland had black skin. Dr. Laura Cassidy, this is 2021 research, uh, is an expert on ancient DNA and genetics at Trinity College in Dublin. She said that the bone fragments found in the megalithic tombs, over to the left, as you can see the map, in Mumu, Lords of the Land, had a direct link between two distinct groups, hunter-gatherers and the farmers. So we're talking about successive movements and migrations who built the large megalithic structures. The DNA examination of the bones showed the Irish hunter-gatherer people had dark or black skin. Now, how many of our students and university populations know this information? I would guess a very small percentage. A new documentary shows what a foundation of Black Irish may have looked like above. In our research, as we are laying out today, it is important to corroborate the DNA data with corresponding archeological, linguistic, and paleoanthropological evidence, as Dr. Winters teaches us. The first black humans came here 33,000 years ago. I'm also doing some research on other parts of Britain, namely the southern parts in Kent, and that's going to show a much older date, but that will be in the future. What does Dr. Sheikh Antidiop tell us? That the Grimaldi Negroids, approximately 44,000 years ago, left their numerous traces all over Europe and Asia, from the Iberian Peninsula to Lake Bacal in Siberia, passing through France, Austria, the Crimea, and the Basin of Don. In other words, there is no other variety of Homo sapiens that precedes the Grimaldi Negroid in Europe or in Asia. Now in issue eight, which I will show at the end of this, um, I also evidence this connection as Dr. Uh, Diop is telling us that, that Russia, the whole of Russia was black and that the burial traditions are connected to the Welsh burial traditions that I have researched which has now been accepted in a peer-reviewed paper, which I'm very, very excited about. 
foundational Black Britons. There are no second frequency in Europe or people classified as white until after 1000 BC. They have only been in Europe for maybe 3000 to 4000 years because they were in Central Asia. All of Europe was black in the beginning. 44,000 years ago, blacks crossed into Iberia and eventually settled all of Europe. The archeological evidence makes it clear that the African population that civilized Eurasia were not monolithic. They include the Khoisan, uh, Pygmies and contemporary Saharan Africans who over time succeeded one another as the dominant European population. This is why we have to be so judicious in our use of language so that when we're talking about Europeans, I always qualify it by saying ancient Europeans, which are black people, and later Europeans are people who classify themselves as white. Let's look at the material culture of the foundational Black Britons. We see the heads of the indigenous people of Britain. The far left, we have a Gloucestershire figure with the same hairstyle as the Yoruba West African maternity figure. Now, what's interesting about that from Gloucestershire is that it was found on the um, top of a sword. And the description was about destruction and warfare. But, but my research has shown that that was, she is probably a feminine symbol, which would have been about balance and protection on that sword. In the middle, we have a Yorkshire head, which clearly has cornrows, traditional African hairstyle. And to the far left, we have the copper cast face from Lincolnshire, which has its African antecedents from Liberia, which is a Poro mask from a secret society. And we see the eyes, the protrusion of the eyes. We see the, uh, the dominance of the cheeks. Uh, the whole style is African. But again, they're not going to tell you this. Uh, there's never any mention of their antecedents in the papers that we find this evidence of foundational Black Britons or foundational Black Baratanas. Again, we must reclaim our material culture and stop giving it over to other cultures. It's time, it's time now to reclaim it. You can see here, the Irish wooden figure has its antecedents in Africa. The style is there. It is about sacred geometry. We see the shape that has been carved out on these artifacts, uh, particularly the, the, the one next to the Irish one, which is to be on your square, which is to know who you are and to see from all angles. This is a very, very powerful image and symbol of our African and our blackness and our indigenous position in Britain. This uniquely Irish gilt bronze head draws our focus and attention. Why? Because down the center of the head rests a middle strip, which has been carved with three faces. And according to Yoruba tradition, whenever the supreme being Olodomar wants to create a person, he asks three divinities. One of the Orisha known as Ubatala to mold the physical body. Once Ubatala finishes molding the head, Olodomar breathes life, emi, through the head, making it a living human being. The newly created human being is then directed to another Orisha called Ajala Alamo, the potter whose special responsibility is to mold the inner head, each containing Ashe, the divine power of Olodomar. You see those three faces. They are clearly etched into the head of this wise one, or a priest, or a druid. 
Now, this was found in a book that is over 30 years old, and it's never been placed in its correct African indigenous context. And as you can see at the top, there are vertical and horizontal lines that position around the head, and they are the Pele and the Gombo, which tie the king uh, to the people in the village or the city as one. And so we see African symbols uh, all over the face of this priest, which is approximately maybe two to three inches in height. And if you look very, very carefully, it has been carved without a mouth. And when I usually get all of my tools out in my magnifying glass, it's actually a serpent, a snake-like shape that is moving up the face, which signals that he is a naga or a wise one. Reclaiming our material culture through the genesis of sacred geometry. This is what we must do. We see a figure from Ireland and we see its concentricity forming around the object. And we can find the antecedents in Africa. The soul washer of the Ashantaheni king wears a gold pectoral disc. And the far left image shows the festival celebration in Ghana with the same gold discs worn by the priests, which shares a cultural affinity with Ireland. Now, what's interesting is that Irish artifact to the left is described in the book as a war, as a weapon of war. You see, when we're not operating from a first sight consciousness, you're going to get these artifacts being placed in an incorrect paradigm. We must rescue it. We must place it in its correct historical context. And here again, we have the same level of concentricity in the symbols being used. This is a more from Germany who's wearing the same symbols. And again, we see the okra, the soul of the king from Ghana around the boy's neck. Now the Moor's dark brown skin is covered with intricate tattoos meticulously produced by thousands of dots of blue black lacquer paint. Now you can't see that, but that piece of information is going to lead to an understanding of the indigenous people in Scotland who painted themselves with intricate tattoos. Also in issue eight, I, I map out some of the material culture of Germany because this is what we have to do with this research. We have to keep ourselves global as well. We, we, it's very important that we understand our foundational uh, black traditions, but we also have to uh, expand our mind and know that everywhere was black. That's very, very important. Now, we find those carved stones, the geometry of concentricity in Ireland and Africa. To the left, a beautifully carved stone of concentric circles from Uganda in Africa. Notice that the center of the stone has been carved a dominant circle a feature in all of the three stones. The top picture is a carved frieze of concentric circles in Newgrange Island. Notice the careful execution of the dominant circle again. Dr. Su Jan Das reminds us there's nothing primitive about making things out of stone. Our ancestors were the world's first masons hewing monuments from stone. And the bottom image is from the Gabon, Africa. All three of the examples on the page have been carved by a stonemason with the number seven consciously inscribed. Is it coincidental that they all have seven rings? 
Well, in MFITS issue three, I talk about the ancient seven and its significance. The carved concentric circles found in Ireland and the British Isles are in fact cultural and spiritual codes of the Congo notion of Simba, Simbi, which translates, hold up that which holds you up. The ultimate statement of intermutuality. Simba, Simbi, iterates the circle as the major cosmological idea. Cosmology as the body of conceptions that enumerate and classify the phenomena that compose and order the universe, as well as the norms and processes that govern it. Our ancestors in the genius carried these complex ideas with them. We have to put our first sight consciousness onto this information. It is the Kometian Ma'atian precept of order, balance, and arrangement. For the Bantu, a person lives and moves within an ocean of waves and radiations. We are always unfolding, expanding, vibrating, and becoming. The Bantu notion of time is Hantu, an African unit of measurement. It situates time and space as an indivisible whole, insisting on continuities and perpetuities. Disrupting European notions of time, late Europeans, chronologies, periodization, and linear time. Hantu is enduring cycles, wheels of time, emblematic of the Bantu notions of dams. See, we're always becoming, we're always being, which the schooling system will never teach our children. Here we have a Nomali figure from West Africa dated to around 17,000 years old. She has concentric circles all over her body, on her head, on her cheeks, on her back. And we also see this within the cultural practices with the um, young girl on her face, the scarifications. Now, this Nomali figure from West Africa, I've also found in uh, Chester, a place in Britain, uh, that too has been dated to many thousands of years old. And that's also going to be part of my later research. Oh, we were definitely here. You can also see the geometry of concentricity on two Irish artifacts. And we see the dominant uh, root, the stem coming from Ghana. You see, if you look very carefully, you'll notice that in the middle of the shape, that it is surrounded by um, pyramids. Those pyramids are very, very important because it's, its symbology is about you, that you are at the center and that you are always becoming and revolving. Now, if we go back to the Irish figure, you notice that this ancestral object has been formed into the shape of an egg. Notice how the head has been positioned as though it is being wrapped up like a baby, symbolizing a return to the beginning. Now, the same symbolism is seen from the priest from Ghana. He's painted his face white, which is always about an ancestral origin, the beginning, pureness. But he swallows an egg in his mouth. The egg is a serpent to symbolize the world and creation. This same message and symbolism being presented to us. This is why we must always have our African mind to see it. You remember on slide three and we saw the hejet, the crown of upper Egypt, Kemet, was white. And it actually is a stylized egg shape. 
the geometry and symbolism of foundational black cultures. We see the landscape of the ancient British Isles was geometrically mapped out using the cosmic egg. Professor Alexander Tom was a Scottish engineer of science who studied the megalithic stone circles of ancient Britain. Tom discovered the cosmic egg in one of the stone circles of the ancient county of Roxburghshire in Scotland. Now, Professor Tom did not attribute this geometry to the primordial black settlers of the land. We shouldn't be surprised by that. But the cosmic egg here is observed encased within a series of sacred triangles, conveying a deep spiritual reverence to the cosmos. These egg-shaped stone structures, according to IVMI, total to 10 around the British Isles. Now, if you just look at the map in the bottom left-hand side, you will see that I have mapped out Forfar, Roxburgh, which is where the egg was found, and the Bali Kulush. These are all black sites in Scotland, which is, I'm working on this evidence right now. Here we see the elliptical egg-shaped tomb of Ramesses. And the oval dome, the egg, was used throughout ancient Kemet as a symbol of birth, death, and rebirth. And yet we find it in Ireland. We find it in Scotland. We find it in Britain. You see this cultural continuity of indigenous people, foundational black Britons, carrying on their traditions. If we look at the Klinyar burial site, which we're going to have a look at, it is the same as the oval tomb. Ivmi reminds us in the ancient Egyptian myth, Ra, the sun god himself, was born anew every morning from an egg. Comprehensive knowledge of cosmic laws are embedded in art and architecture which are a permanent secret to those unaware or immune to such knowledge, but a permanent source of instruction to those in possession of the key. You, you, you see this deep symbolism and the depth of their thinking in their linguistic naming. In Bharatanas, we see Ra, but it also symbolizes the egg the beginning, the endlessness of our existence, the cosmic beginning. Now, if we look very carefully at these uh, very, very important images, these artifacts, there is a site in Russia called Klinyar. These are the royal cemeteries. And if you look very carefully to the left, I have evidenced that their traditions and the shape and the geometry of the royal tombs are in the shape of the medulla oblongata. The horses were buried. And the, uh, the royal skeletons were also found at the top of those burial tombs. The Klinyar Cemetery is interesting, not only for its deliberate and conscious geometry in relation to the layout of the skeletons, but also its burial practices for elite and high status individuals. Now, the dead woman, she was a royal figure. Her tomb was made into a catacomb and inside were found the burial goods a neck ring with a medallion, a circular bronze gilt badge, bronzes, brooches, pendants, belts, shoes, bracelets, a knife, and cake-shaped resin-like matter that appeared to be opium. The grave goods suggest that these items were to accompany her into the next life, or realm similar to ancient Kemi. The woman's head is of particular importance. His skull keeps traces of artificial deformation. Oh, we're going to come back to that. But the gold disc here to the far right shows concentricity 
and a melanated face in the middle. You see this cultural kinship and these cultural continuities following us in a global sense that we were once one culture, black in origin. Now, Kemeta Ube reminds us on slide three that the Moors were living in the North Caucasus Mountains. Over to the left, we have a sketch of the royal burial tombs, the elite burials and then the cemetery. And over to the right, we have the same burial tomb in the shape of the medulla oblongata. We are in fact looking at the geometry of a return to blackness. You, you see what our ancestors were doing? They were holding on to very deep, deep cosmic messages. The authors of this paper date the Klinyar cemeteries as the Iron Age to early medieval. But who's Iron Age? Who's Bronze Age? Who's Metal Age? This commonly used phrase forces us to activate our critical thinking, which imposes strict geographical spaces and false locations of time. We must question and analyze the imposed language and phrases of the latecomers to the human family. A view of any of the heads from the back reveals that the sculptor has given the skull the unmistakable shape of an egg. The egg, a symbol of the divine creation of the cosmos. This is the head of a princess at the workshop of Amana on the east bank of the River Nile. And the female skull on the other side is from the Klinyar Cemetery in Russia. Now let's keep in mind the egg, the egg symbol, the egg artifact from Ireland. This is all the same symbolism. In keeping with Eurocentric explanations for this cultural phenomenon, it is not uncommon for the narrative to quickly turn to aliens and beings from outer space. This unfounded distraction keeps our historical and critical analysis in abeyance. The evidence for the artificial deformation of the Klinyar skull directs our thinking and origin back to Africa. Here, is Princess Nefer Neferuntun Tetasherit and Neferun Nefru. Note their elegance, beauty, and skull modification. The Mangbentu people from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Here, a mother prepares the head wrapping on her infant. Back to the culture, the mother culture. Here we have carved wooden figures showing skull modif modification from Kinshasa in the Congo. Now, back to the foundational Black Britons. What do we find? We find skull modification in ancient Britain. The correct name is synostosis which is a fusion of the adjacent bones. Now in 1865, Dr. John Thurnham, a Yorkshire psychiatrist, archeologist and ethnologist, examined a large collection of skulls found in the counties of Wiltshire and reported them in his research paper. The paper was called on synostosis of the cranial bones, especially the parietals, regarded as a race character in one class of ancient British and African skulls. What did he say? He said, all is well known. The African peoples are naturally dolichocephalic. The largest collection of dolichocephalic British skulls is, I believe, in my collection. The long form of the skull and the premature obliteration of the sutures 
which is what we saw the mother doing to the baby, both of them characteristic of the race. Now let's jump to 2015, because people often say, oh, you're reading really old reports that have no relevance. I mean, that's absolute nonsense. It's a foundation, which a lot of this information is being concealed. But in 2015, two Neolithic period skulls exhibit artificial cranial deformation, resulting from the infant head binding to produce long skulls. Why? Because they were keeping in that tradition with the cosmos, the egg, the beginning of all life. The evidence for artificial skull deformation was recognized at the time of excavation, but has been largely forgotten. We know why it's been largely forgotten. I'm also working on new evidence, which is emerging from Scotland, related to the medulla oblongata. I have more evidence from Scotland. Why has this important cultural tradition been largely forgotten? One major reason is the deliberate process of forgetting. It is to sever any memory of the ancient practices and foundational heritage of kinship and the strong spiritual ties to a cosmological umbilical cord. For example, the ancient Kemeta U recognized the egg as a symbol of the divine creation of the cosmos. Note that in the Russian Klinyar Cemetery, the deceased was returned back into the earth within egg-shaped graves, symbolizing the return to blackness. Now, if you look at the map, all of those red areas, those red dots, highlight synostosis or skull modification that were found in Anatolia, Greece, and Russia. You see, this is what they do. They keep maps away from us and they don't map out these original populations to show this cultural continuity. They keep us very restricted in our sense of space and time. Rendell Harris, I have his book here, perhaps I'll read it later on, but he talks about the black goddess being found in um, Greece as well. Now this figure, this is a carved goddess showing skull modification and synostosis from Stufli, as you can see on the map, the eastern part of the Balkans. And she is maybe two inches in height, in length. So, you know, she's quite tiny, but when we, you can see uh, the design, you can see at the top of her head that that has been deliberately carved because it was revered in the culture. In issue eight, I show all of these burial uh, traditions and the skeletons being put back in the earth in egg shaped tombs. Now, let's kind of be iterative and go back. We talked about the Phoenicians naming Britain Baratanas, and we have an egg shaped funeral tomb, which had the body of a deceased person in the fetal position. How powerful is that as a symbol? The same symbolism is found in the foundation of black culture of Bratanas, Britain. We see the egg shaped stone uh, ring from Scotland. And we see through language that egg once was age an egg evolved from og or og beginning. Eggbro in, York, in Yorkshire was Hberg in the Doomsday Book and Egg Island in Scotland. You see, you see all of these cultural continuities being mapped out on the land. Doomsday, doom means judgment. Our ancestors understood their connection to the land and practice the integration of burial practices and traditions through their bodies, the cosmos and land. Land is more than a physical geographical space, but also to the underlying conceptual principles, philosophies and ontologies, nature of being, 
of that space. Land is spiritual, emotional, and relational. Land is experiential, remembered, and storied. Land is consciousness. Land is sentient. Land refers to the ways we honor and respect her as a sentient and conscious being. As we come to the end, Professor James Small reminds us that the collective self is the fundamental self. Knowing your relationship to the elements, nature, environment, and the cosmos as interdependent. This is the collective self. This is what foundational Black Britons, Bharatanas, understood, observed, and practiced as their culture. How do I become what the Yoruba call the gentle character, Iwa Ipele, or Ma'at in Kemet? How do we put back together a fractured self-consciousness in an educational setting that negates the affective, my emotions, cognitive, my will, and cognitive domains of Black learner identities? We must return to first sight consciousness to rescue, restore, and reclaim our culture as foundational Black Britons, Bharatanas. In doing so, we must honor our ancestors by returning their material culture to the next generation to complete their incomplete works. And so, I encourage you to read MFIT magazine, which I've only been able to give you a snapshot. But when you read the magazines, you will see how this is connected into a whole narrative. MFIT will be back with more evidence from the archives. Until then, Ku Amsha to awaken. Thank you. Ku Amsha. Let's <laughs> awaken. Oh my gosh, Dr. <laughs> Marie Charles. You know, you've put me in a like a sedative state where I was just <laughs> absorbing all of this information. So the breadth and depth of your research, uh, the connections that you have been able to make across the globe. Oh my goodness, it's phenomenal. You Thank know, you. most of us will look at a piece and, you know, we kind of look at it in isolation. Mm. But you have linked it to, you know, various other pieces around the world to show the connection. And, and you've got a whole revelation and insight into the meaning, which is just not what I've read anywhere else. Even the constant, what the, the, those circles, you know, others have described it as, you know, in so many different ways. And it's just phenomenal. Um, I think the family, I, I'm going to have to watch this presentation over and over again. It's a lot. It's, it's a lot. So much in it's there. It's a lot. It's phenomenal. I mean, we have to, and I've said this before, just unlearn everything that we have learned, really, before we're going to be in a situation where we can even begin to absorb the information that you're giving us. Yes. Because I can see from some of the conversation in the chat that some of us have got hung up on definitions that have been given to us. Yeah. And if there's one thing that I found out from my little bit of research compared to yours. <laughs> no, we're all in this together. I tell you, Dr. Marie Charles, if they want us to run away from something, they will give it a negative connotation and a negative spin. And we really have to question this word black. And you have given us, you know, a whole Bible chapter and verse about the importance of black and blackness. You know, I used to just touch on it in terms of the melanin and it being black and what that means and it being life itself and giving birth to life. But you've just gone, you know, into the... The, the, the dot from the eye to the baby in the womb to the, 
you know, and the universe and the outer verse and oh my days, Dr. Charles, you know, where you get that knowledge from, it has to be divine inspiration. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It has to come absolutely. from this, a different realm. It must. I mean, you look at a three inch little, <laughs> <laughs> little um, artifact, blow it up a hundred times yes. and see so much yeah. in there. Oh, it's incredible. I mean, let me find out if there is anyone else in the chat that has that sort of insight. Because, you, know? <laughs> you know, they, they need to, to come out. Wow, wow, wow. The Addo, I'm just going to ignore everything that you're saying because you definitely need to just listen and learn and do so much foundational learning. The Sheriff S is saying the seminars delivered on this channel are so powerful. They are more than phenomenal. I have to agree with you, the Sheriff F. I mean, and we have had, as you know, Dr. Charles, some phenomenal presentations. And, you know, it's like everyone just takes it up another level. And, oh, well, the breadth and the depth of what has just been pre presented to us here today. But I also, but, but, but I also know that that, that particular presentation will be rejected by many I understand that I'm a realist I understand that some people are not quite mm -hmm. ready for mm -hmm. this information you know and I never force it on people but the people who are ready then mm -hmm. they will receive it Ashe, absolutely you know and and Britain the name Britain, we named it. I mean, you know, we've kind of just discovered that we named Scotland, you know, from Queen yeah. Scotia and the yeah. Egyptian pharaoh and the rest of it. And now, you know, for those who didn't know before, we named Britain as well from, what was it, Baracas or what? Uh, and, when you broke, and you broke it down as yeah. well to yeah. show the connection, the linguistical connection to to African language and, and the words like Ra, which we all know from the research that so many of our greats have done, you mm -hmm. know, in, on, in Egypt. Wow, wow, wow. What's Haru saying? Haru Jakey saying, that's why we have to relearn from scholars who look like us. Thank you, Dr. Charles. Absolutely agree. I mean, we can't expect to learn from second frequency people who have no connection whatsoever with our ancestors. Our ancestors are not gonna speak to them through the artifacts in the way that those artifacts are opening up and speaking to you, Dr. Charles. Wow, wow, wow. Um, Mendu, uh, Mendele is saying, DR Congo people are part of the Congo spiritual world, you, one of the most ancient, that the motherland has produced, starting from the Baka, small people now confirmed in the rainforest of Cameroon. Yes, uh, rise up, rise up. We're homing on that. We need to do that. So show in itself, isn't it? Mm. Uh, Ronaldo is saying, we named Britain. <laughs> Thumbs up. It's like, wow, if there's one thing everyone's going to be taking away from you, Doctor. <laughs> you know, when it's like just so much to take in, it's like, wow, wow, wow. But it's a lot. We know you're free now. And, and yeah. we have to, well, we, 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 so then we say to ourselves, why do they keep pushing the word United Kingdom? You see, mm -hmm. that is a, that is a later appellation. Mm -hmm. Why are we rejecting Baratanas? Why mm -hmm. are we rejecting that? Yeah. Which would become Britain through metathesis and the removal of vowel sounds. But our children need to know that, that people who looked like them called it Baratanas. Right, yes. And the profound meaning of it as well. The it's beautiful. Of the naming. I mean, they didn't just give it a name. No. Like, you know, Africans do, even if you talk to Africans on the continent today, their names have meaning. I wonder if you could just remind us, I did start trying to make some notes when you was breaking it down. Wow, being soul and... And then the Ra, the power, and then the Tatanus, you know, protection. Uh, it's just all in there. I find it, I find it just beautiful. It touches yeah. your spirit. 
mm. when you understand the meaning of languages yeah. because as mothers and fathers of everything that there would have been deep meaning in it we're looking through the eyes of somebody who or a group who are late onto the planet yeah. so to not understand the beauty and significance of words divine speech mm. the madunecha there was always something beautiful in language and of course that has been lost yeah. we yeah. have to reclaim this we have to take hold of our culture. It's our culture. Yes, yes. It belongs mm -hmm. to us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Lots of people are not ready for this information. I accept that. But those who are, we must run with this. Mm -hmm. It's our time. Mm -hmm. Stop giving our culture over to latecomers. Mm -hmm. We did it. We can explain every artifact and show its root, its stem, its origin. I say, if you want to have a conversation, show me your evidence and I will adjust my thinking in light of what you present. Simple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rise up, rise up. Uh, Brother Icon in the chat is saying, can we have the get the spelling of the name written? Uh, yeah, Anna, it's in the presentation, uh, Brother Icon. Uh, like, like me, we're going to have to go back uh, over it. But I think it was B-A-R-A-T-A-N-A-S, uh, Baratanas. So Baratanas, yes. Baratanas, yeah, we're going to have to, you know, be able also, to break that down and speak to it into, right. our, into the minds of our children. That's right. Wow, wow, wow. And hence why they're moving away from Britain now, because they knew they know we're catching up. You know, <laughs> they're monitoring all the time. They know they, we're catching up with the knowledge. And so That's they're right. trying to be one step ahead now, renaming it United Kingdom. That's right. <laughs> and, and you will find, uh, the listeners will find the references in issue three. I, I break all of that down with Britain. I show you who King Ofa is, um, one of our Anglo-Saxon Moorish kings who was related to Spain, which was called Mercia. I mean, there's, there's just so much information. I, I, I feel like I'm drowning people sometimes because there's so much of it. Um, and I have to remember that we're all at different points and different degrees of acceptance and receptivity. So, you know, I, we have to be very patient. Yes, oh, absolutely. Because we've all been brainwashed. We've all been indoctrinated with a whitewashed version of our history. Um, and, you know, someone in the chat said that to think that we've been looking through the eyes of people who, who do not have our betterment in mind and that sums it up really you know we have been uh, trained to see the world through the eyes of people who have just arrived here the other day compared to the time you know that we have been uh, here on this planet and um someone's saying you look like Halle Berry <laughs> 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 Hi, Harry. looking like Halle Berry let me scroll up and uh, see what we've got in here um Mandile saying uh, that's new for me. I, I'm one of the five co-tribes in South Africa. Definitely worth researching, okay? And uh, Gebra is saying, how can you reject fat? Sounds like Wazungu behavior to me, so can't respond to someone there. Give thanks, Marie Charles. And uh, let's scroll up and see if we've got any questions or points. To think that we have been taught that society started with second frequency. What a revelation. What a, well, you know what? Second frequency, they're Johnny come lately on the planet. I mean, we have been around for millions, possibly billions of years. Who really knows how long we've been on this earth for? But according to um, the presentation that we got from Dr. Clyde Winters, uh, you know, the, the Caucasians, uh, only came on the scene around about 1500 BC, you know, with the um, when the ice cap melted after that explosion in the uh, 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 Simonian region or, or somewhere like that. So they really are Johnny come lately on this planet, and uh, they've certainly, certainly made their mark, taking over the education system, 
and have just given us, um, you know, when you hear the truth or even just a snippet of our ancient history and the depth of the knowledge of our ancestors and the celestial links as well, because, you know, I, I happen to be looking at Newgrange and, you know, I looked at the, the circles and I noticed you know, that I've seen those rings in other places as well. But, you know, you were linking them, you know, all over the world, these, uh, these circles. Uh, and that site in Newgrange, which is an ancient um, African tomb, when the, at, at the um, winter solace period, it lights up. Yes. They, they have constructed this tomb in direct kind of alignment with the celestial with the stars and the, and, and the season, so that when it comes to the summer and the winter solstice seasons, the middle of the tomb lights up. I mean, how ingenious is that? That's right. That's right. Light technology. Yes, that's what they introduced. Imagine the mathematical calculation and the knowledge of the season and the stars and the planets that you would have to have in order to be able to construct a monument that like 5,000 years later still lights up at the winter solstice and the equinox. Uh, it's just mind boggling. Yeah, it is. It's very, very powerful. And then you find second frequency in their droves. Yeah. They <laughs> parade around that particular area because they feel that energy, yeah. you know, they, whether they feel it or not, I don't know, but they, they want to be part of it. Yes. Um, but you know, they understand the power of it, don't yeah. they? They they have the knowledge. They do. They know that there's some power, yes. and they want that power. That's right. And as you say, they are there, and it's ours, created and built by our ancestors, and we don't even know anything about it. Most we of don't. Us. You say because it's been taken out of our African minds. Yeah. You know, when you think about how the teaching profession is dominated mm -hmm. by a culture, a particular cultural group. Mm -hmm. uh, when I did my master's degree, which is now almost 20 years ago, mm -hmm. um, one of my um, studies was teacher numbers. As a former classroom teacher, I was looking at the representativeness of the teaching profession. And there were only... Um, I identified 22 black teachers in the whole of Liverpool from a 5,000 workforce. Wow. Now, I, and then in 2016, I wrote a paper with my colleague, Professor Boyle, and the, the, the number was 18 black teachers. Wow. So it is by design that they do not want melanated teachers mm -hmm. in the classroom. So having this uh, pipeline being severed from when we go from school. We're never encouraged to become teachers mm -hmm. because we never see ourselves. Mm -hmm. So it's a whole machine. It is an organ. It is an institution that keeps us from ourselves. Mm -hmm. It is by design. It is mm -hmm. deliberate. It's conscious. And we have to keep breaking this cycle we have to keep injecting coming in with the counter narrative backed up with lots and lots of evidence mm -hmm. and it will get out there mm -hmm. lots of us are still not quite ready for this information because we've gone into a schooling system that has taken our minds mm -hmm. literally mm -hmm. you know when I think about my own experiences when I started school I, I can't, I, something was in my spirit as a child where I, this just doesn't feel right. And I was always in tears mm -hmm. as a child and no one understood, mm -hmm. but it eventually it gets beaten out of you, mm -hmm. but that, that flicker never goes away. Mm -hmm. And then I was fortunate enough to, to bring it out in my doctoral thesis and, you know, the publications and the, re, you know, so that's wonderful. But, but for me, I'm very concerned about the ones that don't make it. I want the research to reach those individuals who still have a little bit of a flicker going mm -hmm. on. And they just need the information to resonate with them mm -hmm. and to say, ah, oh, OK, that sounds familiar. Yeah. And to take that research on. Yeah. 
and that's the aim really that we start to reach those minds that are still reachable yeah yeah at a young age wow 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 you know look at me learning all of this in my grand old years <laughs> imagine if i knew what i knew now you well, know 20 30 years ago oh, absolutely gosh and as you say you know it is by design why you know we are kept from having our own schools and and having our own teaching institutions etc because what they have cleverly done is they've whitewashed us out of history, basically. And they, their biggest fear is what's happening tonight, is that we will begin to uncover the truth and bring back to life, you know, our ancient ones, the foundational Black Britons, the foundational Black Scots and Irish men and women and Celts and all the originals who were indeed Africans. Oh, my gosh, you know, uh, like yourself, I, I was born and brought up in, in Britain. And uh, one of the favorite kind of curse words that we would have growing up by that the, the young white children would throw us us would be, why don't you go back to where you come from? <laughs> of course, they're talking about go back to Africa. Little yeah. did I know I was already home and I should be saying to them, yeah, I, I'm home. You go back to where you come from because you have just reminded us today from the research that you've done that we are the foundational uh, people of, of Britain and of Europe. You know, what we saw today in your presentation were the faces of our ancestors, you know, and what we're talking about is their great works and the culture and the civilizations. Uh, that they had actually developed from Africa and carried with them all over uh, Europe as well. Uh, let's go over to the chat. Are, are you able to see in the chat, Dr. Charles? Are you? I can't see anything. No. no? Okay, let me go into the chat and see what we've got here. Uh, Ronaldo says, art is such a massive part of black culture. In Southern Africa, we have drawings in caves from my Bushmen, the Khoi and San Aztec ancestors that backdate thousands of years. Yeah, I mean, I've been to Zimbabwe and I've seen the, um, the, the drawing, the rock art in Zimbabwe as well. And you know what, Dr. Charles, all over Africa, there's just so much of our history. They're staring us in the face. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just accessible in a way, you know, we know that if it was in Britain, anything ancient like that would be cordoned off, you know, it would have probably a, uh, a house built over it and you'd have to go through the door to be able to see it. And they call, they put the label on the door, museum, yeah. you know, they take all of the good, but there's so much African history, not even just over Africa, but as you were saying, all over Britain. I mean, when you start family researching your history in Britain, in England, Ireland, Scotland, the world, we are going to have to start, you know, jumping in coaches and going around Ireland and taking first hand photographs of some of our history, taking pictures of some of those um, burial mounds that you were talking about, you know, making a note of all the artifacts that they found in those burial grounds. And there are so many more that are yet to even be excavated, you know, because as, as one of our presenters said, I think it was Dr. Winters, the deeper they dig, the blacker it gets. <laughs> Absolutely. Fed up with doing these archaeological digs because we just keep turning up. <laughs> <laughs> And then we come along with our, our first site analysis and we say, but that's black, that's yeah. African. Yeah. Do you know, I was just thinking, um, I think the uh, Sister Shanice, that, that I, I do find it, I find it a little bit sad when I think about how people are still getting caught up in the blockages of language mm -hmm. and then people will reject certain aspects of our history because they're focusing too much on the language. We have to learn how to use language in specific contexts and spaces. We have to learn to maneuver around the language and to not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. We have to understand that our ancestors revered their blackness. There was mm -hmm. a science 
to blackness. There still is. But we also understand the, um, the, the importance of the, the Moorish titles and, mm. and how that is tied to the land. But, but we must know when to use that language when we're talking about foundational black Britons, foundational Moorish Britons, whatever context that we're in. But we must be in full receipt of the knowledge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, it's even it was just on my radio show today, I, I was saying, because we got into this discussion about uh, black because it often comes up, you know because the Europeans have given such a negative connotation to the word black, you know, um, you know, it was like in the 50s and 60s, it was black power, we're all proud to be black. Yes, I'm black and I'm proud. And, you know, there's all this black thing. And then uh, by, by the like 80s and 90s, it was being rejected, you know? No, we're not black, we're Africans. We're no longer black, we're Africans. We mustn't use the word black and, uh, you know, the color of black and all, all this and, you know, kind of started rejecting black. But what we do know about the movement in the, in the 60s, the black power movement, is that the CIA and others, they infiltrated that movement to destroy it. They destroyed it from the inside out and they wanted to destroy absolutely everything and anything associated with the black power movement. And of course, they're gonna to wanna to destroy the word black itself. And you have just delivered for us. And I think we all need to go back over the yeah. old presentation in terms of the definition uh, that you've given us for black. And when we talk about black, we all need to be able to quote you know, the, those lists, the lists of all of the connotations to do with blackness from ancient times, you know, right through from ancient times to medieval times to current times, right yes. up to the black power movement Yes. in terms of black. See, and and then set that aside from the Caucasians definition of black. See, and empowered people name mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. They don't wait for outsiders to mm -hmm. name them. See, mm -hmm. that's what we keep falling into. Yes. We name ourselves. Okay. That is powerful. And when we can say, when we say black, we mean duh, 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 duh. that Absolutely. is powerful. Yes. Uh, and I'll give another example as well, which I, I've given before my, on my radio shows. When I was a little growing up in school, um, you know, if you were naughty or something like that, they'd say, you know, go back to Timbuktu. Timbuktu was, you know, used as a place of shame, a place of disgrace, you know, like go and stand in the corner over there at Timbuktu. And it was only later on in life, I get to learn that Timbuktu was one of these early ancient universities that where the Greeks came to learn and we have philosophers and mathematicians yes. and, uh, you know, Timbuktu, yes. and it was used as a curse word. And another curse word that I found out later on about as well was we would be called Sambos. I'll oh, use Sambo. Only later on to find out that the word Sambo, Sambo was a god for the Naga people. Sambo was the name of a black god. And so they used, they took the name Sambo as a word, as a curse word, yeah? yeah. I haven't even dropped yet the works of, um, I haven't got his book to hand there, but um, it's, El it's, it's uh, Johnson's book um, um, about the um, Asian Africans in Britain and the British Isles. Oh, yes. When he talks about the word N-I-G-E-R, and he breaks down the etymology of that word, and when I do drop that, because we all, that's another word we all run away from, the N-word. My rap keeps coming off today. I think it does be funny. <laughs> when we all run away from the N-word, but family, family, if you knew the etymology yeah. of that word, you would fall off your chair, yeah? It meant God's chosen people, the Nagers, the, there's a place in Africa named N-I-G-I, Niger. I met someone from Mali and I was talking and he was telling me that it was from Niger. It, it's spelled N-I-G-E-R, but the way he pronounced it was Niger. And they have taken that as well and corrupted it. 
N-I-G-E-R, which they corrupted, N-I-G-G-E-R. Man, God's chosen people. You couldn't even use the word N-I, me, in ancient times because it was held so sacred. Mm. It was so sacred that if you was to use it, it was like you were blaspheming. Mm -hmm. And this is what they do. Mm -hmm. They've taken the word black. They've mm -hmm. taken N-I-G-E-R, you know, which you can even identify back to a landmark. They've taken, you know, the word Sambo, you know, Timbuktu, and black, and so much else that, you know, was intended by our ancestors to give us a sense of pride yes. in who we were and who we are. And they made it instead to be a, a, a point of shame. That's right. That's so right. we have to redefine for ourselves and as you said take back the power and redefine for ourselves the meaning of some that's of right the but we also know that 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 is it's like being given we have to perform i know this sounds very extreme but we almost have to perform brain surgery on ourselves to restore our psychological faculty we've spent 12 15 years in this schooling system mm -hmm. so that our minds have been removed our mm -hmm. african minds have been removed and dr amos wilson of course we all know that great psychologist psychiatrist uh, teaches us that mm -hmm. but that's what it requires every day every mm -hmm. day you have to wake up and you have to consciously get into our traditions, in our culture. I know that you can't really see, but in my every room, I it is filled with artifacts. That's how I wake up every day. Because you have to restore your mind. Mm -hmm. you, nobody comes over to see me anymore in my house. Because <laughs> <laughs> oh, <nobody> no. <laughs> <laughs> because you have to step over you have to walk your way through <laughs> it's a museum I yeah. Over there. <laughs> yeah. but 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 that's that's what it takes yeah. that's what it takes wow. and they speak to you <laughs> they, they, they do they do i know when every time i pick up and i'm examining the artifacts yeah. something happens wow something happens every time uh, yeah. sometimes I'm, I'm directed to go back and examine a piece again. And yeah. it's like what Bob Marley said. We have to, it's, it's in the wind. It's in the, and you have to listen to that natural mystic. You have to be tuned in, mm -hmm. but the tuning in is honed. You have to open up your mind. You mm -hmm. have to have a pure heart. You have mm -hmm. to want to do it for the right reasons. Yeah. And the rewards are enormous mm. in terms of that yeah. to have yourself back whole yeah. that is priceless yeah. absolutely and realize priceless. the greatness you know of our ancestors and therefore our greatness uh wow uh just we are greater than we realize people yeah. we really are can yeah. we quickly go over to the chat times whizzing by we've got eight more minutes before oh, the wow. the hour yeah two, <laughs> two hours have flown by oh Ooh. my gosh attack 50 says boss says uh why uh why does there have to be a deity that's uh, a white point of view we don't know how to ask questions because we have been so misinformed and continue to say we are God. We are the deity that you are looking for. Why is it so difficult to walk in that reality? Okay. Uh, Kwame Kwame says, Tag, we have deities in Africa, I humbly say. Uh, stop using white man's argument to make a point. Okay, so they're having a conversation and a debate amongst them. I hope you guys are tuned in here and not just, you know, having your own conversations between <laughs> each other uh, in, in the chat. Let me uh, scroll all the way down and see what we've got going on. Uh, Icon Bay says, until we start to rule the world and can change the color of law, we have to be mindful of identifying yourself as black. Okay, why wait until we're the rulers of the world? First of all, we have to rule our own mind. We have to take our mind back. You know, it starts in the mind. Uh, right, let's, uh, oh, we've got lots of hashtags here. Uh, Africans. Black voodoo is the strongest. Drop the Afrikan, pick up 
I see three blackness, black power, voodoo, voodoo. Okay, lots of hashtags there. Not really into hashtags. I need to get into it. Uh, okay. Uh, Ubuntu saying, keep rising, warrior queen, sister Shanice, Dr. Charles, you are awesome. Budum. Oh, thank you. Yes, you are awesome indeed. Sheriff F, sir. Oh, this is a message to Sheriff F. Yes, that's the Swahili translation. So they're having some trans. Some Swahili translations going back. Agree, Sister Shanice, it starts in the mind. Uh, Sheva Seth says, we are listening, sis. Yes, indeed. It, we have to, to, to transform the situation that we find ourselves in. First and foremost, it has to be a transformation of the mind. As our brother in his presentation, uh, Franklin Jones, reminds us, you know, the war is for the minds of the people. And there's another famous quote. I think it's for, uh, it was Steve Biko who says, um, something like the most powerful weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. And so they understand the power of having control of our mind. Hence why they are so determined to keep control of the miseducation system. I was talking to someone here today, he has seven children. And uh, they're all on the motherland now. And he took his children when he was living in Birmingham out of the education system. He said, by taking his children out of the education system, it was as if he'd committed the biggest crime ever. They had the police on his case, the social <gasps> services on his case, the education institution on his case. The prepared, they were all on his case to get his children back in the school because that's where they do the programming and the most wrecking of our minds. Dr. Charles, come, come in. That's because they know. They know what is hidden inside of us. Once we're given the right information and the conditions for that to flower, they know. They know exactly our power. That's why they have to keep us in a system that deadens the brain, deadens yeah. the self. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's a very brave person that you're talking about to take the children out yeah. of the schooling system. You know, I'm also very mindful of the generations who who really put their trust in the schooling system. Mm. They didn't know. They thought they were just yeah. in their innocence, yes. sending children to be educated. Yes. So I do have a little bit of sympathy for that, mm. because mm. when you don't know, you mm. don't know. That's right. That's right. You just don't know and don't know. You don't know. Yes, but, but but being on the other side, being part of that schooling system as a teacher, mm -hmm. as a child and being part of that system, I know what goes on in the staff rooms. Mm -hmm. I know what goes on in these meetings mm -hmm. and it's a very closed culture. They, they see you as an outsider. They keep mm -hmm. you as an outsider mm -hmm. and they don't welcome you in. Mm -hmm. they, they almost look at you and say, why are you here? Mm. this mm. is our profession mm -hmm. you don't mm -hmm. belong here mm. yeah. and I was uh, you know and, and I taught I taught in Dubai I taught in California I taught mm. in North Carolina mm. I did some sessions in Russia and it's it there there is a strain a strand that follows that you you look out of place when you're in that realm that sphere mm. of teaching mm -hmm. and of education because mm -hmm. they're so used to controlling it, controlling yes. the narrative and yes. everything that goes with it. But, yes. you know, we have to be strong. We come in. Absolutely. We dismantle because, it. We show yes. the evidence. Yes, yes. Because for them, it's part of their matrix, isn't it? Yeah. You know, they, it's, it's the way that they keep control and they've all bought into this system. So wherever they are, they could be in Russia, from Russia to America, you know, all over Europe, they're all... It's their hidden secret keep the truth from the africans Absolutely. don't let them know you know that the africans were the first people of russia the first people of germany the first people of austria first people of britain and the british isles the first people of the whole of europe don't wow. let them know you know that we, we were the first people of the americas you know don't let them know and so it's there they've all got a vested interest in keeping us ignorant of the truth mm -hmm. because at the end of the day what's ours is ours wow. you know if that land belonged to us yesterday and our ancestors were the first people on that land and were the owners of the land yesterday if 
People come in and invade and take it away from us. They have stolen it. And it, we are still, nevertheless, the rightful owners. So family, go to bed knowing that you're the rightful owners of Britain, <laughs> the rightful owners of the whole of Europe, the rightful owners of America, the rightful owners of the globe, because our Asian ancestors populated the entire globe. At one time, as was pointed out my show earlier today, uh, before the, the land mass broke up and the waters came in between, the whole world was Africa. The whole yep. world was one. And yes. we took our culture over the uh, entire globe. And uh, Dr. Maria Charles is bringing to us the evidence of the continuity of our culture. And um, it's there everywhere, you know, in, in, and they've left the evidence, the trail of evidence for us, haven't they? Absolutely. It's just for us to do the work and the research that you've been doing. And, you know, they'll bring it to light for us. That's wow, right. wow, wow. It is now 10 p.m. Oh my gosh, the time has just flown by uh, to everyone in the chat. Thank you so, so much uh, for staying with us throughout the day. Tag 51 or follow us in one or two more comments. Uh, Haru is saying, yes, yeah, Steve Biko, the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. Thank you so much. I almost got there in the end. I got a picture on for Dr. Marie Charles is a very accomplished researcher. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely agree with you on that. Uh, we look forward to it. What are you looking forward to, Faru say? We must continue to listen to our people and pass proper info to others. Remember, the man won't treat you right, won't teach you right. Okay, yeah, if the man won't, Treat you right, he sure ain't going to teach you right. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, fantastic. Yes, Steve Biko. I know someone else reminded me of the quote uh, from Steve Biko, an anti-apartheid activist, hero of my people. Thank you, Ronaldo, uh, for that. Uh, people saying word. Yes, digging you up in the chat. Thank you all so, so much. Um, please do um, share the works of uh, our sister, uh, you can go to her website. You can get her magazines. There is just so much information in these magazines, family. I tell you, I've, I've got the sixth edition, uh, this one here. Hopefully you can see it because the screen I'm using is a bit difficult for you to see. But there is, it's packed with photos of artifacts. Oh, so sorry, you can't see. I'll have to change the background. Uh, it, it's packed with, with um, pictures of artifacts, descriptions, information. Uh, it goes into the minute detail of some of these artifacts. And, you know, we need to be teaching it to our children. Yes. And, you know, the images of artifacts that you've got in here, family, you would have to travel the world. You would have to go to museums all around the world to see these artifacts. And, Wow, wow, wow. This is like our Asian history just being brought to life. I want to congratulate you, Dr. Marie Charles, on your awesome, awesome work. Thank you so, so much for taking the time to present to our audience today. Audience, I hope that, you know, you share the information to your family and friends, that you get the magazines yourself. We have to, we have to do the reading. And we have to do the research. And we're the ones who are going to have to tell our stories ourselves like Dr. Charles is doing. No one's going to do it for us. No. There is a training course coming up as well. Dr. Winters, uh, Dr. Clyde Winters, he's doing a training course. If yes. you want to learn research skills, if you want to be able to do research like Dr. Charles is doing, do the course for Dr. Dr. Clyde's training course, okay? Uh, it's an absolute must. I've registered. I'm going to do it. And I better get off before my, my rap drops off today. <laughs> can, I just, can I just say, Sister Shanice, that Dr. Yeah. Winters yeah. is going to write the introductions for the trilogy that I'm doing on Ancient Scotland, which oh, is wow. going to blow your mind. Really? Really? Watch this space. Wow. Watch this space, family. Maybe we can invite you back when it's ready so that you can share some little nuggets with us, you know? Wow, wow, wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Charles. You have been absolutely phenomenal. Keep up the great 
great works. We so need you and we need the information in your works. And family is pointless. All of that work staying in those books. We've got to read. We've got to get the books and we've got to read the information and we've got to teach it as well. Okay, yes. so final quote out of here, all the way free says, much, much appreciation and respect, Sister Shanice and Dr. Marie Charles, FBA, all day FB for FB1 forever. Foundational Black Africans or Foundational Black Americans all day, uh, B1. <laughs> forever absolutely be black and proud as we used to say in the 60s oh haru where can we get them from where can they get your book from uh, they're let all me... on amazon you'll find every single one on amazon and Brilliant. if you go onto the website you will be able to see um, um a snippet of the books so you can get an idea of what's inside Thank you. I've just posted your website address uh, in the chat. So you have that there, family. Uh, thanks for all your love. Thanks for all of your support, Mr. Wilfred, all the way from Bermuda, we rise you up. Uh, get the word out to, to Bermuda. People are saying we need to do virtual tours of some of these museums. You never know, I might be able to organize something like that because we can get into the museums online now. We don't have to physically visit. So we can have a Zoom online tour of some of these museums and yeah. claim back those artifacts that they're trying to claim as their as own. Theirs. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm a pain to let you go, but I must let you go <laughs> because of time. Dr. Marie Charles, enough love, enough respect. Keep up the great words. To everyone in the audience, please be black next Monday, 10 p.m. UK time, and then next Wednesday, 8 p.m. Uh, UK time for another fantastic, blacktastic uh, show with some awesome guests. Uh, oh, my days. Absolutely awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Marie. Thanks Thank you, Sister Shanice. Thank Bye you. Bye now. Bye Thank now.